I hated one of my professors in university for this. He made me hold eye contact with people, like, as we were introducing each other as a class. We were doing introductions as a class, and my, I, my professor made me hold eye contact with people as I was saying their names. And I started crying about halfway through. And this was only, like, I only had to say ten people's names, and I started crying at the fifth person, and I walked out. I'm like, I can't do this. I told my professor before we did the exercise, I physically cannot do that, and he told me anyway. I hated it. I should have complained to the university about it, but it was exhausting. If my if my flat could look like this right now, I would try and get it to be like this. I've already got like the bay windows and everything. Oh, we can go outside. Oh. Yeah, we can go outside. The doors are open. Yeah, this, yeah, holy shit! Um, this is this is this would be a luxury fucking apartment. Damn. Yeah, I've got um I've got a balcony, uh, balcony bay. And I've got the double French doors, but there's no actual balcony. The way I've got this starting to get laid out back home. This is it. I mean, if you like starting the interview, like I get excited about housing, so you'd be like excited about housing. All right. So, name plates are off. And you don't have to give an exact name, but what would you like to be called or known as? Um, are we talking like something closer to gaming or closer to IRL name? Because mine's fairly generic. Or it's, what are we it, aiming for? It's whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, let's go based off of my gamer tag. So the nickname that people give me based off of my gamer tag is Cass or Castle. Hmm. Um, okay. I am a young woman with mental illness living in, I, I'll give a general location. Yes, I sound North American. I'm from Canada, but I currently am living in the United Kingdom. I'm over here because why not? <laughs> give your exact age. You could give an age range, but how old are you? Early 20. Okay. And you had said, uh, you know, you were born in Canada and now you live in the UK? Yeah, I'm over here temporarily just messing around, hanging out with friends until I back, go back to finish school. Okay. That's the game plan, but knowing me, things change and, well, we'll see where I end up in the next six months to a year. Okay. All right, so obviously you speak a English, but do you know any other languages or are you wanting to learn another language? I'm bilingually near fluent in French. Hmm. Um, almost, I'd say I'm getting close to business level, but it, I need more practice. A lot of how my language learning is through practice. Mm -hmm. um, outside of it, uh, uh, my first year of uni, I was trying to learn Japanese, Korean, and Mandarin Chinese on top of English and French. So occasionally my brain gets a little bit scrambled between what I learned then and what I'm what I'm actually speaking now. Definitely makes things interesting. Yeah, sounds like you're kind of mm, mm, doing a little bit too much there. Like, you know, only like four or five languages at the same time. Yeah. I, I'm very much an overachiever, and this was something where I was trying to prove to myself that yes, I have the ability to, even if I burn myself out. Hmm. Um, I dropped everything except for French after that. <laughs> Mainly because it was, uh, it was quite a bit, and I decided that I was going to spend more time focus on learning a single language and getting that down before moving to the next. Okay. Turn the voice up. All right, and now to ask the most difficult question. The deep. The most the difficult deep question. question. <laughs> what is your favorite color? Oh, I hate you for this. I hate you for this. <laughs> <sighs> oh my lord um there is a right answer and there are many wrong answers black <laughs> no not really not really um 
Believe it or not, it's actually, um, it's the color of my curtains right now. If my mom sees this, thank you, mom, for the curtain because they are gorgeous. Um, my mom got me a uh, floor to ceiling blackout curtains, but they're a very, very nice, like, oaky green, kind of like the plant behind you by the uh, hammock. Hmm. Um, okay. It's th it, that color. Got it. Huh. Another yeah. green game. They're huh? honestly, they're really nice. Hmm. Hmm. We'll they to... block out like ninety percent of the ninety to ninety five percent of the sunlight. Like, like I love them. Yeah, blackout curtains are really nice. Helps you get better sleep. What brings you to be your best self? Oh god, now we're getting question. <laughs> um. Best self in what context? Because there's a lot of different things that bring out better aspects of me, but bringing out my best self as a whole is not something that, that is as easily achieved. I instead separate myself into best sections, so I've got a best work self where I'm highly driven, highly focused. I've got a best social self where I have a bubbly personality and I'm conversational. Um, and I've got, like, I haven't discovered a best relationship self because that is a terrible idea. <laughs> and that's something that's always evolving. So, I don't have a best self that I constantly present. Instead, I would rather give pieces of myself necessary for different jobs. Well, what and brings make sure that you? I perform well within that context. What kind of things helps you to be your best self in those areas? Um, at work, it's in terms of getting work stuff done. It definitely like laying out the entire game plan before I get to work on something, knowing okay. everything that I'm supposed to get done, and then the time, the end time is of which uh, I can't wish right now. Knowing the entire list of what I'm supposed to get done, as well as the end goal, the end time of when I'm supposed to get it done. And then being able for me to... Pardon. Um, me being able to uh, then pri reprioritize what needs to be done as things come along. And then just leave me to it. That is probably the easiest way that I function. Um socializing a lot of it is if i need a break i'll probably end up like making like i'll end up signing because i know a little bit of american language as well i'll probably end up signing washroom and then walking off for a two or three minutes and then coming back and that's giving myself respite from continuous social interaction i am an introvert it's not something that comes easily to me but when i socialize i'd like to think that i socialize relatively well when I have those necessary breaks so what I'm kind of getting from that is preparation knowing all objectives that need to be completed and then taking time to yourself to recharge yes okay on a scale of 0 to 10 how often do you lie to yourself 0 being all the time. Ten being, I never lie to myself. Zero. We're being straight up. It's zero. Cause that's the only way I get stuff done is if I lie to myself. It's the fake it till mostly fake it till you'll make it. Um, or fake it fake it until you have a mental breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that's one way of doing it. <laughs> fake, fake it till you have a mental breakdown. Um. It's the easiest way for me to get things done because I'm con I'm talking myself into achieving the tasks that I need to get done, even if I'm reluctant to those tasks. Continually talk to myself that it'll be okay. You just do this. You just do this. You just do this. It's never just that. <laughs> it's never. Oh, I need to go like finish this. I need to go deliver this. You deliver this. Um, letter. It's never just delivering the letter. It's I have to make all those stops along the way as well, but the letter is at the very end of the street. Mm -hmm. 
though, if I have to walk all the way to the post office to drop off that letter, there's also, I need to go get my, because it's a pay-as-you-go electrical card, um, groceries, like, all these other things that I have to do along the way to the post office. <laughs> but it's talking myself into, okay, I just have to do the post office, and then along, then on the way back, that gives me then the opportunity to do all the other things that I've been missing and neglecting to do. <laughs> it's like, well, since I'm already out here, I might as well do this. Since I'm already out here, I might as well do that. That is generally how I operate in line to myself. So, so it sounds like, well... I know I have this one thing to do, but I ain't fucking doing that one thing. And instead, I'm going to do everything all at once to make sure that I'm really getting the most out of this trip. Yeah, yeah no, I will never... And everybody around me will say that this is something I do frequently. I will never leave my flat unless I'm doing more than four things during the day. <laughs> hmm... I will. Yeah. I just don't leave. I have. I have. I have honestly no reason to leave my flat unless I have uh, multiple things to do, like heading out for groceries or. Um... I mean, I yeah, literally groceries, topping up my bills. <laughs> I literally do the same thing. It's just like okay, so if I'm going to the gym, then I'm also going to the store. I might be filling up on gas. You know, like I'll, I'll try to really just combine everything in one trip. It's just efficient. You know, for me yeah. in particular. Yeah. All right. So, as I mentioned before, usually people talk of from about anywhere from two to four issues. How you know, within the span of one to two hours. Um, anything you'd like to talk about, go for it. You obviously know which one I want to hear about first. <laughs> but yeah, it's up to you. So. I guess I'll just mention, so I was specifically asked to come here to talk about my mental health experience and specifically how I interact with my disabilities. So to start off, I'll just go down and I guess my portion of the interview will, at least this portion will be just me talking about how each of my disabilities interacts with me directly and then how I believe they interact with each other because there is some overlay in symptoms. So the first and the biggest, or no, I'll, I'll leave the big one for last, because that's the big one. Um, chronic, so the first one I guess is probably the most mild. Let's see, chronic depression. I am not medicated for it, I'm just doing my best in trying to mitigate it myself. Mm -hmm. um, my doctor is back home and I believe that there was never any need for me to be medicated for it, because it came and go in waves and was linked into the next disorder, which was generalized anxiety disorder. If my anxiety spiked, if I was going through an anxiety despite English, <laughs> if I was going through an anxiety spike, there was very likely a depressive episode that was going to come after. And they kind of just came and go and wave and we just like, okay, well, they never really lasted more. Like it wasn't, it wasn't like I was having like a month or two long depressive episode. It was like two on, two weeks on, two weeks off kind of thing. Or like, okay, well, it's just cycling. I've got two weeks high anxiety, two weeks depression, two weeks high anxiety, two weeks depression. It's somewhat regular. We can anticipate what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're like, yeah, go work out a little bit, have a lot of water. And I was, I'm not kidding, prescribed three to four thermoses of water a day. And my, like, my thermos is about the size of my forearm, too. <laughs> <laughs> Looks at arm. <laughs> yeah, it's a big, th it's a big thermos. Um, I was prescribed three or four of those a day just to make sure that I'm staying hydrated because that's something where my diet does have a higher increase of salt, so I need water to balance that out and dilute all the sodium out. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, my depression and my anxiety are both pretty regular and easy to deal with once the signs are very obvious. So, and like everything with me, everything's obvious. <laughs> so walk us through like what that looks like, because uh, you know. 
speaking from like a like a neuroscience standpoint you know we have chemicals that you know come and go based on like whatever we're experiencing so you know we got the good chemicals uh, serotonin endorphins from exercise dopamine etc uh that make us feel good and then you know cortisol uh, and and others that you know make us feel bad and you know the common statement is is that when our stress becomes too much then it outweighs the good chemicals uh, which would kind of go hand in hand with what you're saying where, you know, anxiety can be, you know, good to a degree, but if it goes, you know, out of control, then, you know, you, you would likely have a wave of depression afterwards. So that being said, like walk us through like what this experience is like for you. We'll start from the anxiety side because that's kind of where the cycle, that's, I guess, where the cycle starts. So... Most of the time, my anxiety is peaked by frequent trips outdoors, um, being around other people frequently. Um, sometimes on the very... This isn't so much a rare occasion anymore, but... Um, people shouting loud noises, things like that. Things I get spooked outside very frequently. So, generally the anxiety will start, like, am I walking alright? Like, am I walking oddly? Um, is the way that I'm walking standing out because I don't want to seem too out of place? I don't want to seem too much like an immigrant, even though I am. Um, it's just a lot of walking. Walking, being out in public, and then am I fitting incorrectly with the others around me? Um, and then getting to work, showing up at work. Work usually goes fine. Um, and this is part of the reason why I picked the overnight shift, is I don't have to deal with many people coming through the drive through <laughs> Um, I don't have to, like... The only people that come through the drive through are like at three in the morning and they're either drunk or high. It works. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, yeah. Um, people, with, people with the munchies. <laughs> exactly. People with the munchies. Um, and a lot of it outside of, honestly, most of what we do in the store is just cleaning. And then towards the end of my shift, once around like five, four or five, six a.m. hits. Um... I'll be off shift and I, of course, start to get sleepy and everything because I've been awake for so long. I get on the bus, I get home, um, and I guess this is kind of where, like, the anxiety and having been, like, the anxiety peaks towards the end of my shift a little bit. I say peaks as in, like, I start to notice that I'm not functioning like I normally do. Um, and and sometimes I need to take medication to mitigate that just a little bit, just to bring that, bring the threshold down a little bit. Um, and then yeah, I bus home. I get tired. My legs, my knees in particular, like this is gonna be like a weird thought. Like so, at back, <laughs> my brothers called it the knee pit, <laughs> the like the back of your knee, and then like an inch and a half down that is where like the worst of the pain is mm. it's um lower te it's a lower tendon spot and that's purely due to cold oh, okay. um and then if the buses are late that just makes it all worse and it's i'm at the point of okay like it's almost 7 30 in the morning i've been awake for 15 hours i want to go the f home <laughs> censorship because i don't know what the rating on the video is yeah at that point i'm just tired i want to go home i'm a little bit cranky um and then if the if i keep that up and i'm working like if i'm working 40 to 48 hour weeks here which are normal and legal um if i'm doing so then around week around the start of week three is when i'll start to get lethargic because I've been peaking so much mm. and I just don't end up liking to talk I don't feel as 
eager. Um, it's very obvious that I'm low energy. Um, my colleagues noticed um, a little bit last night, I think, when I was working. They noticed I was at the kind of tail ending. And they were like, do you need like Coke or coffee or anything like that? Um, I end up, especially during depressed cycles, I end up just chugging a lot of caffeine. Not energy drinks, because those are gross. But just like, I will do shots of espresso. <laughs> I'll do one at like 2 in the morning and one at 4 in the morning and just down the shot. I'm like, okay, let's go. Hmm. Sounds familiar. <laughs> Sounds very familiar. Okay, so... Um, what I'm kind of getting out of that is when you are exhausted, you know, you're reaching the end of your energy levels, you start to, you know, as you mentioned, peak. It's kind of like you're at the end of your rope. Things are harder to deal with, harder to tolerate. And, you know, if you I'm peak visibly too much, praying. Exactly. And then you kind of use medications to help with that a bit or caffeine. Um, and, and things would, you know, start to, to go downhill from there. And if it happens for too long, boom, depressive episode. Yeah. And then depressive episode is, and that's the reason why I have so many dry goods, like cans and things like that. The easy tab open cans, um, rice noodles, rice, um, lots of like chick chicken stock cube and things like that. Because I'm not always, when I'm in those states, it's not, not so much I'm not willing, it's I am not fully able to care for myself. And the most that energy-wise I'm able to do is, um, like, go take a shower. And that's, the shower thing is an integral part of my routine and keeping, um, parts of me sane. Um. Yeah, having all the dry goods there is, like, backup food because, um... I don't want to leave my apartment if I absolutely have to. If I absolutely have to be leave my apartment, there better be a damn good reason that I'm leaving my apartment. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, no, I've got everything I need here. I've got clean clothes, I've got food. Um, I've got very limited socialization through the internet, which is sometimes all I need. Otherwise, I'll spend two to three days not talking to anybody and just doing random things in my flat. Uh, the big one right now is I need to clean because I have a flat inspection on the 17th. <laughs> so I need to get rid of all the Amazon boxes that I've got. So, I mean, so, so the first issue you mentioned is just kind of the anxiety of being around people, the, you know, perception of others, uh, and, and just, you know, worrying about uh, fitting in in general. Uh, just any time that there's another person around, it kind of sends you into, to, like, fight or flight mode, you know. Crawl off into the corner. The just more be people on your phone. there are, the worse it is. Mm. The more people there are around, the worse it is. I'm fine generally up to, like, five or six people, but um, dinner rush at work, for example, is a kitchen. Um, we can have up to... 25 30 people in a kitchen same size as my the same size as my apartment basically like it's not like everybody's touching elbows and stuff and i'm like i don't like having my back to you guys because that that is what makes me panic the most is having my back to people mm -hmm. i guess it's a perception and awareness thing i like to be aware of what's around at all time right. so having people walking constantly behind me throws me off and i don't like it those who don't affect my day-to-day -day life as strongly as the big one does mm. or the two big ones i should say because they're ones that i can or mostly deal with on a self-regulatory basis. What would be the two big issues? Uh, the two big ones are diagnosed autism spectrum disorder. Um, and... I mean, I occasionally hear, like, voices in my head, though. 
there's potential that it's either it could be borderline, but border board in the middle of English. It could be borderline personality disorder, or it could be um, very very minor schizophrenia, or I could just be like crazy, which I don't know. No, no, no crazy. Listen, listen. I mean, it's a, it's a very old saying: crazy people don't know they're crazy. You know, so we can rule yeah, that one true. out. I enjoy my crazy though. My crazy is fun. Yeah. Um, I Occasionally, say, my crazy t my crazy um, tells me jokes and things like that. So it looks like I'm laughing at random stuff. Our idiosyncrasies and weirdness is what makes us interesting, and it's just you know, it's nice to not judge others for those things. But which one would you like to talk about first? Um, the autism is probably going to be the easiest because I think that the voices are like a, also a possible sub-symptom of um, the post-traumatic stress disorder that I have. Mm. It literally could be anything and that where like I'm willing to talk and explore about that after I talk about the autism. Okay. The autism is a bit more clear cut. <laughs> um... And I guess that's the autism, I think, is where all of my social communication issue comes from, where I am not extremely sociable. I don't constantly like talking to people. It's all that's part of the reason why I got the autism diagnosis. I don't read Q well, and a lot of my worries about being out in public stem from the fact that I don't know if I'm copying people's behaviors well or not. Hmm in an effort to try and fit in and make other people feel comfortable. Because if I was comfortable, oh, I'd just be randomly singing random shit down the street. <laughs> like, you could hear anything from, like, Black Veil Brides and Mariana's Trench, or Asking Alexandria. You could hear anything from, like, that end of the spectrum to Frozen. <laughs> <laughs> like, Let it go. Oh god, no, no <laughs> copyright. No, I didn't say it. <laughs> no DMCs. No DMCs. Um. So okay. Yeah, it, it quite literally could be like, I I vocal stim. I have a cacalia. I do. Wait, you so I let me let me let me magnify that real quick. Because, you know, how many people actually know what stimming is, right? Unless you're in mental health or the autism community. Yeah. You know. um, so what is let's, stimming? Let's highlight the stimming. Um, stimming is a form of self-stimulation. It means self-stimulation. Um, stimming is the kind of like code word that we use for it. I just realized that my mouse is moving around because I still have it on the box. <laughs> um, <laughs> stimming is self-stimulation. It's short for self-stimulation. It means that um, it's a series of, of movements, vocal tics, um, um, sensory inflections that we use to stimulate ourselves in order to help us deal with an deal with some kind of not so good feeling. Compulsion. It's usually reactionary to our environment stimulus. It, so, so that would be a good question to ask: Is is it a compulsion? Or is it like not being authentic, right? Because it's painful to not be authentic. How would you differentiate? Um, some stims are easier to hide than others. Um, it really is the self simulation is doing what feels right mm -hmm. in order to keep yourself from fraying. Um, so some people click their fingers a lot. Um, some people tap, uh, tap their fingers together. Occasionally with, um, you'll see some autistic people like arm flapping or skipping, or it really could be anything. Mine generally present as, um, knuckle rubbing, which is easier to hide. Um, echocalia, which is vocal mimicry. So certain things that I hear in my environment, I'll copy them back if I like the sound. Mm. Um, I have been mistaken for having Tourette before because it does seem a little bit like Tourette. It's not though. It is simply me like, I like the word potato. <laughs> for example, I don't understand why. 
but my brain has decided that most of my curse words when I'm out in public and around children are going to be potato. <laughs> so if you hear me, instead of me saying, what the fuck, you'll hear me say, what the potato, <laughs> for example. Like, <laughs> that's basically, it's a... <laughs> Like, that's the, that's the kind of... I've got, like, words of the week that occasionally I go through. Um, the one that's the hardest to hide that is a stim is I have a head twitch. Um, and it, it's usually... It almost feels like a head shake. Um, and strictly to the right. To my right, specifically. It'll be a sharp jerk to the right. And a couple sharp links, and that's almost, it's almost like a mental reset whenever I'm, I'm doing that, because it's like, okay, like, stop. Like, pull my gaze away from whatever I was focusing on. Stop. And then usually it'll follow by... The head, the head twitch will be followed by either a vocal stim of um, a hum or like a, a throaty scream almost. Or it'll be followed by like hand flexing, twitching, knuckle rubbing, and it looks slightly violent if I'm being honest. Um, but it's me trying to get the physical sensory stim in that I need to make up or whatever's going on. I'm trying to match usually another form of stimulation that I'm getting through one of my senses, which for me most of the time is a hearing one. I'm very sensitive to audio, so if I'm getting like lots of car beeping or um, someone's playing loud music close by, my then reactionary response will be, okay, I need not bright lights, because bright lights make everything worse for me, but usually it means, okay, I need something touching me. Um, usually I end up going and getting like a glass of juice or something, so I've got taste. Um, I've got very, very nice lemon hand wash that I use for a scent, um, and I try and match. Some people will try and match the sti what the sensory input, and some people will try and just actively avoid all sensory input because that one particular one is so overwhelming. I go either way. Most of the time I try and match, and then there are some times where it's I withdraw. You know, it, it all sort of ties together with everything else you've been talking about is, is, you know, you have urges to, you know, stimulate in different ways, whether physically or by audio or mimicry. Uh, and when you don't uh, fulfill these these urges or potentially compulsions, or maybe it's just you being authentic, if you don't fulfill these desires, it stresses you out. And you, you describe that as fraying the rope. And the more you deny these urges, the more, you know, things start to break down and, and get to critical points. And then you start to peak. And on top of that, you're yeah. trying to uh, exist in society without being viewed as like an extreme outcast or, you know, everyone doesn't like to be judged and everyone wants to be accepted. So like that's, you know, you're, you're basically playing you know, life on, on, on like very hard mode or like, you know, like super challenge mode. Just like the hardest difficulty. I'm playing life on master mode straight up. Exactly. So like you're having to balance. I, I make a lot of Legend of Zelda references. This is for anybody <laughs> who gets exactly what master mode is. Type in the comments um, <laughs> what I'm referencing. Um, um, yeah, I'm playing life on master mode and... I wasn't exactly given a great head start as a child either. Um, and this is where I the PTSD ties in. Um, childhood PTSD did not make things easier for me at all. I was formally adopted by my grandparents and it... My grandma tried her best with what I was dealing with. But it she didn't make it very easy either because of the expectations of she potentially had a restart on raising my mother. So I had to compete with my mom's memory, or I felt that I had to compete with my mom's memory in order to feel like I was able to exist within the household. And then years of therapy, I was put into 
we almost, I think we ended up at one point, it was um, twice a week counseling. It was twice a, twice a week with um, not a psychologist because I ran away from my psychologist twice. <sighs> I found a counselor that I liked though and I actually stayed in her office so they're like, okay, well, we're just gonna stick with this one then. Um, and she helped me deal and process with the fact that there was a lot that went on, a lot of trauma, a lot of mental scarring, and a little bit of physical scarring as well. She helped me learn to process with it. And actually, I think it was due to my first counter that I went from wearing sweatpants all the time. I did not wear anything except for sweatpants or skirts as a child, as a young child. And then I think I was around 9 or 10 when I wore my first pair of denim. And she was proud of me. She was proud of me for wearing denim. Uh, because how... I've been refusing to wear really anything outside of that. On that point, some of my you... some of my trauma was hey. in relation to like some, some of the clothes I was wearing. <laughs> I, I... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> how how uh like describe what it's like on a tactile level? So like touch, you know, and sensitivity. Like so, because 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 like, that's that seemed like a very good tactile point is. You know, were you wearing sweats and dresses because it was comfortable, that it was a good touch? Like, what's that like for you? Specifically, it was, I never, I never really wore shorts. And if I wore shorts, they were long, like, basketball shorts to my knees. Um, and that was due to my own uncomfortableness, my own discomfort with being hypersexualized, especially as a child. So, the long shorts were, like, the shortest I would go, and then any skirts that I wore were usually down to my feet. And that was a way of me trying to hide, basically, my lower half. Mm. I'm trying to avoid us putting in heavy trigger warnings at this point. Um, because people, I'm, I think, can kind of infer what happened. And I don't, I'd rather not say it aloud. Mm. Okay. But. The only thing I would ask going is, from... is, was this person a friend, a family member, or a stranger? Family member. And I'll be even more specific, it was immediate family member. Mm. It was an immediate family member that caused my trauma. So, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't pretty, everything that happened to me. And I, I used to wear a bit of denim as a child, and some of my trauma happened while I was wearing denim, and my brain, for some reason, associated the denim with my trauma. And then I started wearing denim slightly later on, as I started to develop and hit puberty. Um, mainly because I thought that, oh, tight pants means that my hips will stop growing. <laughs> I was a very weird child with my thought processes. I mean, um, I mean, there is some logic in there, you know, <laughs> you're like, you're like, oh my God. And, you know, it's, I had weird logic. It's, it's, it's squeezing my legs. They're not going to have room to breathe. I mean, like, hey, you know, I believe it. I had a pair I, I miss that pair of denim, actually. I called them my Frankenstein pants, and it's because they were basically patchwork denim pants. Like, we had taken, like, five or six different squares, or five or six different pairs of denim and, like, square them out. And then they were really, really big and patchy, like you had stitched, like, giant pieces of skin together on a zombie or, or something like that. And it looked oh really God. cool, and I remember really liking those. <laughs> Do you have a picture of this? Uh, or could I you don't, Google but I might be able to Google similar? them. I can Google something similar, yeah, I'll do it afterwards. Because, okay, yeah, yeah, I really miss those pants. Those were really, really cool pants. Okay. I had so... a couple other, like, things that I enjoyed as a child, but it took, um... Dealing with my trauma did not get easier as I got older. Hmm. Because of the hyperfixation on sex and um, 
sexual health things. I unfortunately was sexualized even by those around me, um, immediately around me. Um, peers, family members, um, even walking into a place like Urban Planet or um, River 21, because I know that's an American store that people I think would relate to. Um, walk into shops like that where like oh like young teens kind of thing i was at like 11 12 years old i was assumed to be close to 16 or 17 just on physical maturity alone and it did not make things easy because my peers were like oh she looks good she looks great she's a young woman and it didn't it made me feel gross inside because they weren't seeing me for all of my quirks and personality traits and the abilities that I had. Super and then master I ended up mode. Switching schools. Jesus. Super master mode. It just made everything worse. <laughs> um, um, I was basically running around on what. Actually, some people in the gaming community might get this the um, the, the one hit the one hit KO mode. I was running around at that point on one hit KO, <laughs> one hit knockout, mm -hmm. um, and it was exhausting. That was also the year that my mom regained, like, formal custody of me was passed back to my mother. Um, I still lived at my grandparents for a little bit after that, but it was like that was that whole like end of grade seven, start of high school. That was like so many changes. Um. My idea of parent changed, my house changed, um, schools changed. I went into a private academy because we knew that I wasn't going to succeed in public high school. Um, shortly after that, we found out I'm autistic. I got my diagnosis at uh, 13, 14, somewhere in there. Mm. Which for a girl is actually relatively early. Um, yeah, that was just a whole mess of ack. Why? <laughs> um, and socialization wasn't easy as well at the private school because a lot of the classes are maximum 40 to 50 students. So a lot of like our peer groups were just the same people. 40 to 50 students for the entire grade. That's how small school was. Oh, wow. Okay. So we were stuck with, if you, if you started dating somebody, the entire school knew about it within 24 hours. Sounds if you got into right. a fight with somebody, if you were, if you got into a fight with somebody, you were stuck with them for the entirety of your high school career. There was no escape from bullies. There was no escape from people around you. Because we were all just stuck with each other, so you basically have to suck, up, suck it up and learn to deal with each other, because otherwise you're going to just make everybody else's lives hell. My place in high school, like, all of us kind of ended up finding our own little, little places in the high school to exist. If you were popular, you ended up hanging out in, um, either out on the soccer field, or you were in one of the uh, designated classrooms. All the smart kids want to go hang out at the science lab because there's no food allowed in there. They would just spend their lunch break. They would have probably eaten, like, scarfed everything down and then gone and continued on their work. There's two places you could find me. The fire escape door was always unlocked, and the alarms were turned off on that particular door, so I would go out and sit on the balcony. Hmm. Or you would find me in the special ed room with my... At the, she eventually ended up becoming my girlfriend. Um, and we dated through, I'd say, almost half of my secondary years. Yeah, for almost half of that. Dating as an autistic person is really weird. Um, well, so as far as the uh, sexuality goes, uh, how would you describe that? Attracted to both? All? Um, I've... 
to summarize any pronouns, don't call me late for dinner. I don't care what equipment you got below, just cook me some good- just cook with me and help me make good food. And although, cuddles. <laughs> like, that's- <laughs> I'm very simple in what I like. Um... At the same time, I'm very specific about the people that I look for and that I associate with. Mm -hmm. um, like, if I click with you, I click with you. If I don't, I don't. It's straightforward. Thankfully, it's somewhat straightforward. And when you say thankfully, that's in reference to everything else on the spectrum. That that's is not in reference to the fact that I went through a roller coaster of self discovery. I wasn't a, I wasn't permitted and I wasn't comfortable to do any of like any self exploration about myself until I turned 16, 15, 16. Why are you not permitted? Um social constraints within my family circles and within my social circles. My family is a weird mixture of agnostic, Baptist Christian and I edging on Catholic. That, that sounds like Armageddon. Branch. Yeah, it's it's heckin' Armageddon. Like, family dinners are always, like, we just don't talk about church. We don't talk about any of that. Religion as a whole is, like, a no-go topic. Um. <laughs> All right, everybody, let's sit down and have a prayer. Prayer, what? What, you still believe in that crackhead in the sky? Yeah, <laughs> like... It, it was... It, it wasn't that bad. That is my stepdad's side of the family. We just don't do dinner prayers there because of my grandpa on that side. He would say that. <laughs> my grandpa on my stepdad's side would say something about crackhead in the sky. Um, on my mom's side, we just all respectfully bow our heads because, well, it's grandpa that's like, grandpa leads prayer and nobody goes against grandpa on that side because grandpa's a, grandpa's a pirate. <laughs> And he's scary with the turkey tongs. <laughs> he's a pirate? What does that mean? Um, uh, he's a self-proclaimed pirate. The man is a jack of all trades. He essentially raised me and I admire him greatly. Um, he's a... He's an... He's a... How do I put this? He's a commercial truck driver. HGV class, HGV class kind of guy. Um, he's also formerly a construction floorman. He's also a blacksmith. He's got all this like trade stuff under his belt. He's incre He's incredibly brilliant, but he never properly graduated school, I think. I think he dropped out in grade nine. Hmm. And he's... Um, 90% sure he's got dyslexia or something like that, because he has issues writing. But he was the first person, I think, that... Per he's the first person that made me feel like I had the ability to take on the world and charge forward like a bull. <laughs> charge forward and take, take the bull by the horns kind of thing. He taught me how to chop wood, but he taught me how to do um, some automotive stuff. I can change the tires and replace oil on a car if I want to. Um, I can drive in the snow because of him. I know a little bit of trucking, trucking tips and tricks for dealing with 40 foot plus trailer because of him. Like, he is part of the reason why I was able to get comfortable with myself. Because he didn't enforce a lot of the traditionally feminine roles onto me, like my grandma wanted to. My grandma tried to get me to learn to bake and sew and all that stuff. Even quilting, I think, at one point. Yeah, um... <laughs> There's a reason why we have multiple hospital visits logged for me as a child. <laughs> and it's not because of grandpa, it's because of grandma. <laughs> mm. The sheer number of needles, sewing needles that I put through my fingers, uh, among like varieties of other incidences. <laughs> it uh, just like, 
I never fit into any of that stuff. Instead, nah, like, if you ask me, I could make you a damn good meatloaf. I may, I make a damn good meatloaf because I put, thanks, I put, like, turkey stuffing in it, Thanksgiving stuffing in the meatloaf, and it tastes delicious. Um, yeah, no, I can make fajitas, I can make tacos, I'm great with seasoning soups and chilies and things like that. I cook, but I won't bake. Because my cookies end up going flat and my cakes explode, so we're not <laughs> we're not gonna um, we're not gonna go there. Um, but no, I take on a lot of the more traditionally masculine roles. Even in my workplace, like some of the girls will ask me to do some of the heavy lifting for them because um, I've got just the sheer strength to do so. I'm fairly. So I mean, I would them? use the word chunk. I, I'm flexing a little bit on the boys. Um, squat is the word my grandfather would use. Like, I'm compact. I use the word chunky for myself because I'm just a little bit thick and I think I'm thick in all the right places. But how many C's, though? Oh, a lot of the, where it goes C's and then you've got the silent D's all the, at the end. Oh, Jesus Christ. We have entered the D-Zone. <laughs> We've entered the D-Zone. <laughs> Thick. D -d -d -d. Um, I think in part of one of my coping mechanisms for my PTSD is sexualized humor. I make a lot of dick jokes. <laughs> and I think that's part of my coping mechanism for it is... I try, that's one of my big coping mechanisms for anything, is I try and find humor in whatever situation that I'm dealing with. Um, generally, like, my base humor is dick jokes, because I'm an immature 14-year-old boy inside sometimes. Um, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> nothing wrong with that. It makes things interesting. Mm -hmm. um, other times, um, I'll just randomly be like, well, that wasn't too bad. And I'll say it with this cheeky smile on my face, and it just makes my colleagues... With a like, southern like, accent? <laughs> well, that wasn't With a too southern bad. accent, too. They they find it funny here. They find it funny here. Do you know how weird it is to hear a Glaswegian specifically? I've got a Glaswegian colleague. Do you know how funny it is to hear him try and mimic a southern accent with just this strong Scottish... <laughs> So, a lot of that was, like, really good descriptive information of, like, what life is like with, you know, on the spectrum. And, you know, like, I myself definitely uh, mild to moderate uh, ADD, so we're, like, cousins in that regard. And I've already had, you know, a couple things that you've said that, you know, like, yeah, I like to go out and do everything at once or, you know, certain things uh, with, with, with touch and uh just perceptions and social stuff and stimming uh, but just in different shades uh so I'm you'll get occasionally like the good blurb of wisdom like when um when i was talking about like how i use my humor as a coping me mechanism you'll get like the one big blurb of this is hella deep and then me just going instantly back into like trying to pull shits and giggles yeah i think that i mean i i I refer to that as like our child selves versus our adult selves, you know, both work together to help us succeed in life. And it's very important to keep our child self alive. So there's definitely nothing wrong with having, you know, young humor because like that's how we have fun. You know, being our kids selves is how we how we have fun. Like, you know, the, the adult's job is to kind of be responsible and make sure we survive. Uh, but, you know, adult self sucks at having fun, tend to be too strict, too formal. My default tends to be like that. My default is pretty formal. Mm. Um, if you saw me walking down the street, and I guess this is a form yep. of masking, which RBF. is autism code for hiding my autistic actions, such as dimming a kakali and things like that. Masking. Um, and masking, I could go on like another blurb of how big masking is and all that. 
Yeah, um, it, yeah. I'd say let's let's talk about that uh, because you know you sort of talk mentioned about like, yeah, because you mentioned like how you know what what it's like, how it feels, uh, but a little bit more into the perception management of others and how you feel pressure to mask so that you're not you know an outcast. Like, what does that look like? Right now, um, if you were to see me right now in the interview, I have what we would call resting. I definitely have a resting bitch face. <laughs> I'm not smiling. I'm. Oh no. Uh, well, and that's just my default is it takes energy. It takes so much. It takes more energy for me to make facial expression. Mm. So things like smiling at people down the street, waving hello, talking even. Um, I'm mostly nonverbal on my way to and from work now, just as a default. Um, I've taken less to hiding my autistic stims and more just looking like I'm socially anxious 24-7. Which people then give me a bit of birth on the street because they're like, oh, we don't want it that are off, and I'm just like, perfect. Um, but yeah, things like talking like break things like talking smiling um raising an eyebrow during a conversation things like that are all aspects of social communication to show interest to show alertness they are things that don't come naturally people on the autism spectrum we have to go and deliberately take acting lessons go into therapy to learn how to do things like that mm. For me, it takes about four to five times the normal amount of energy to smile, even if it's just by myself, unless it is something that deliberately works my lip. Things what like talking, I, with the exception of echocalia, I, I don't talk much within my own apartment. I tend to sit in silence, or if I'm in a voice call, I have a resting vision. Bitch. Well, I, th I think everybody has RBF like when they're on the computer and nobody's yeah. watching, you know, the face. Uh, gosh, what was I going to ask? I tend to be more monotone uh, as well. I'm deliberately ooh. putting in a little bit of inflection to try and make it sound like I'm more normal. <laughs> um, okay, so like, let's take I'm this perfect example and I want you to just relax and, and just let go just at least for you know the next minute or so and then what does that look like even just through your voice the monotone is not easily recognizable outside of it it's a lack of vocal inflection mm. a lack of deliberately putting energy into my voice my voice gets deeper it gets raspier on purpose because I'm not putting the effort to try and make it lighter. Right. There are still some things that I've been forced to naturalize, such as pausing at the end of a sentence. Or pausing for commas, what would be commas and things like that. Ooh, okay, so that's 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 a good thing to kind of point out. Because people are, are, are absolutely take it for granted that as soon as the end of the sentence is over, period. It's over, period. Whereas you are describing that you just keep on going with anything that comes to mind. It's a non-stop train for me. Mm. It's a non-stop train. I, I pause at awkward places because I'm trying to get my brain to catch up. I'm trying to get my mouth to catch up with what my brain is doing and I'm having to backtrack my brain constantly to what was that thought that I was trying to talk on? What was that point that I was trying to talk on? Mm. And through there, through eight-ish eight years, no, wait, wait, five, five years of autism therapy, five years of autism therapy has forced me to naturalize commas and periods within my speaking as well as certain vocal inflections and voice control voice control being the biggest one um i used to need sound cues to when i was shouting to when i 
I would be shouting. I wouldn't recognize that I was shouting or speaking quite loudly versus whispering. Mm. And as a whole, because people found that I would get too loud constantly, I end up becoming quieter and quieter until I just shut up entirely. And that was my way of dealing with it. Uh, the masking in form of, of talking and tonality, uh, just in the way that you speak and, and sentence structure, commas, periods, not wanting to ramble on for too much. What about body posture? What does that look like? Um, I present myself as more confident in what I actually am. The time I do know what I'm talking about, and I tend to come off as slightly aggressive, whereas it's my way of trying not let myself get run over. Mm. I feel like, and this I think is part PTSD, part autism. I feel like I'm constantly getting run over by people verbally, where not all of my words are taken seriously because of, especially once I've outed my disability. People then end up treating as if I'm infantile almost in some ways and it annoys the heck out of me mm -hmm. and other people because I mask myself as overcompensating and overachieving I then get so many responsibilities piled on to me that I break hold on, hold on. I haven't really found a um, DM between the two yet where I still present myself as capable, but I am able to show that I'm not capable of everything that they think that I'm capable of. So what I'm kind of hearing from that is when you get up, when you're walking, when you're in a room with other people, you present as more confident, more capable than you feel that you actually are. So then they have a different expectation of you and you have to communicate that you know they think the expectation is over here and you're like no it's actually like over here you know i'm i'm right here is, it, is that is that what, what I'm it's hearing? a very common thing mm -hmm. yeah it's a lot of self-advocating for myself or my disability for what i'm capable of achieving some of it is some of it takes a while to explain i spent most my secondary years trying to remind my teachers that I'm autistic because a lot of them would keep forgetting. Mm. I had one teacher who, he was probably the reason why, why I graduated in the first place because I didn't want to cause any more trouble. <laughs> um, he was the only one that remembered I was autistic. He also though like helped take care of me when stuff wasn't going well at home and when I started fighting with my mom and everything. like well, you When know... things went dark going south like one thing I want to point like chocolate bars and granola bars in his desk. Sorry to interrupt, but the one thing I want to point out in there is it, it almost seems like a a silent sadness. Everybody kept forgetting that you were autistic. So if they were forgetting that, that must mean that you had to have been putting in a lot of effort to successfully mask it. To the point where my average, I went from averaging six hours of sleep, ten hours or is it leap without of effort I was putting in. Mm. Like, my sleep schedule wasn't great. And I had to put it with the amount of effort I was putting in to try and, and act normal. Up until my gra graduation year, I was averaging almost 10 to... Yeah, 10 hours of sleep a night because I was putting in so much effort trying to mask at work, at school. And I was trying to keep myself afloat hmm. I would end up crashing during the night and then yeah. grad year I said screw it and I decided that I was going to try and be more authentic to myself and it wasn't so much thing like it was I let a few of my autistic rates shine through a bit more the biggest one being the hyperfixation the amount of times that I was registered late for classes, I had more late marks on my on my quote-unquote report card that year than any other year previous. And it's because I spent so many classes where, okay, you want this project done, 
you want the essay done. I'm on a roll. I'm gonna finish it now. I'm not going into class until I get this thing finished. And then I'll catch up and I'll manage to do whatever's going on in the other class. I didn't find switching between class every hour or every hour and a half very easy. So I would just keep working. They had... I made it almost damn near impossible. I was... I let every inch of my stubbornness come through. They had so much difficulty pulling me away from whatever I was working on that they eventually gave up. It was also the year that I came out as not straight in a private Catholic school. And I firmly gave zero shits. This is where we're like, put the duck sound over top of me swearing, yeah, please. That yeah, would be great. That, yeah, that's what we've been using is a wah. <laughs> the duck. Yeah, the wah. Um, I, gave, I, I eventually stopped giving a shit about what my professors and what my peers thought of me because I wasn't extremely well liked anyway. And I'm like, well, I'm, I, you guys already have no expectations for me. I'm going to create my own. Um, I entered, I had entered shop class, construction class the year before for my grade 11 year. Grade 12 year, I said, I'm going to use this to build furniture. I built myself all the fe all of the furniture that I have in my bedroom back in Canada. And I got it, I didn't stain it because I like the natural wood, but I got it all planed myself. I did it all myself and I'm proud of it that hmm. i that expectations for myself rather than trying to that, that the ex rather than trying to follow the expectations of others i followed my own expectations for myself and that was a lot easier to deal with because i was permitting myself to fail if be. whereas with others i felt i had to be perfect i felt i had to have perfect mimicry i had to follow all of their social cues perfectly when I knew that I couldn't, I didn't give myself room to fail when I was around others. With myself, it was easier because it was just, and I had myself for accountability. Just to raise awareness, what kind of social cues would you be on the lookout for that most people take for, or, or rather just do subconsciously? Um, things like standing posture, hand gestures, Blinking even. Um, shoulder shrugs, eyebrow raises, vocal inflection, raising pitch, decreasing pitch, um, eye contact, probably most recognizable. Hell, I hate eye contact. I still do it anyway, occasionally, because it's required, quote unquote, required of me. Mm. Scale of 0 to 10, how much does it stress you out to maintain eye contact? Oh, 100% of 10. I hate it. Oh. If I hold... I hated one of my professors in university for this. He made me hold eye contact with people, like, as we were introducing each other as a class. We were doing introductions as a class, and my, I, my professor made me hold eye contact with people as I was saying their names. And I started crying about halfway through. And this was only, like... I only had to say 10 people's names, and I started crying at the fifth person, and I walked out, I'm like, I can't do this. I told my professor before we did the exercise, I physically cannot do this, and he told me anyway. I hated it. I should have complained to university about it, but... It was exhausting. I ended up having a meltdown that day, just from the amount of energy it took for me to go back to class. Finish class. And I didn't feel well enough to go and continue the rest of the day, but I still went it anyway because I felt I had. I ended up going home and my mom couldn't get me to do anything that day. She wanted me to do dishes, she wanted me to vacuum and do other household things. I couldn't do anything. I went back to my room. And it's not so much that I slept, but I let myself mentally drift. And I was unresponsive. That is how far it will go. Like, that is how exhaustion goes. Stuff like that. Vocal so, inflection. Um, posture. Those are all, like, in my opinion, they're slightly easier to copy. Eye contact. Head nodding. Showing that were Showing things that would be traditional act listening. 
are things that are extremely difficult for autistic people because it's not ingrained enough naturally like it is for other people. I hate people who say, oh, we're all a little bit autistic. It drives me insane. Like, no, you don't. You don't cry on eye contact. You don't cry when a schedule doesn't go your way. You don't have a meltdown from someone having, oh my god. Um, strobe lights. Strobe lights are hell. You don't cry from strobe lights or things like that. Like... I felt horrible for my mom had my mom took me to see a Cirque du Soleil presentation back home. And I felt horrible because my one of my brothers bought one of these mini light things that you can get. Where it's got um it's got an LED on the end of the string and the the rotor with it bends it so it looks like bending in, it looks like you've got like a light circle or something like that. I hate those with a passion. They hurt my eyes. They make me excited. So in other words, and because we're seeing you at a club every night, all lights blaring, all the time. With sunglasses and industrial <laughs> earplugs in, yes. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm going to a club, I've got like the weird little foamy construction worker earplugs i've got those in and a pair of very strong sunglasses okay so you the girl I... who wear wear the sunglasses at why do you think i'm on night shift <laughs> i mean i i would have went with the you know there's less people as an initial you know reason but that's see you know that's why we're talking I about mean... this there's many reasons <laughs> there's many reasons it's not just people um it's not just people, it's quite literally quieter, um, less people to quote-unquote offend. Um, first thing in the morning when the sun is just coming up, honestly, the sky is just starting to light up. It looks gorgeous for one. Um, I generally end up walking out with a coffee and then watching the sunrise on my way home to, from work. But also, it's not incredibly bright like midday. I love sleeping through the middle of like the peak of sunlight. It's great. I'm not squinting everywhere. <laughs> I can actually have my eyes open. I'm not walking half blind. Because everything is almost white out for me. Wait, is that even with sunglasses? Uh, with, sungla with sunglasses, it's not quite white out. Like... It's like having your brightness turn. Like, if you take your screen brightness, you take a picture, take any picture, you've got the normal picture, what it looks like, and then you've got a picture beside it of, like, brightness 200 and contrast, like, contrast up as well. Yeah. It looks like I am constant. My, my vision is constantly at, like, brightness 150, brightness 200%. And it makes everything basically like that photo filter. So at night, I don't have to worry about that because I've got great night vision anyway. I perceive light better than some of my friends, I think. And also just, I don't have to worry about a lot of light input into my eyes and then... Because eyes, I, I, corneas and everything reflect natural light, which is how we perceive it. Um, it just makes it easier for me to see things around me as well. Okay. They're comfortable. So, gonna recap. We've talked about um, the depression and anxiety uh, episodes, which is primarily caused by a lot of, uh, you know, autumn stuff. Yeah, just just uh, spectrum quirks or you know uh, challenges to where you know you you have a high perception you know physically, uh, mentally, emotionally, just with you know how you are around others, having to mimic them, having to 
you know, mask, uh, the things that, you know, you would want to, to stimulate yourself with. Uh, every time you don't stimulate yourself, it's very stressful. Uh, and just really just so many different uh, elements that just cause, you know, far too much stress for you to be able to uh, function. Uh, and, and like over the course of the years, you've received like a, a lot of a lot of therapy, a lot of, you know, mental health support to, you know, from what it sounds like, just be able to fit in with society, but in a way that still gives you a little bit of breathing room. You know, it sounds as though over the years you've I've had, had to, to create find... my own breathing. Right, you've had to find strategies. My only, my only recommendation, I guess, for people who experience them learning is do not rely on others to create your space, because this world is not made for people like us. We have to create our own spaces, fit in, comfortable. And in order for us ultimately to connect with others, we have to make the faces ourselves fit in. It's not easy, and it is a struggle, but it is worth it in the end. It is worth it once you get over that hill. Finding finding out what you use to make hope and putting names to it does help. It helped me more than I thought it would, being able to label my vocal stuff as Echidalia. Because ultimately it is copying. I can quote word things word for word, and I know it is an echocolic action. And being able to label it as such is immense relieving. So, besides the anxiety and depression waves, and then the life on the spectrum you said that there is one more issue or did we already cover that we didn't totally cover it and that was the weird voices thing and oh yeah, yeah where so. where the voices potentially come from okay so i me... kind of put names to them it's we're not myself and i have had a talk with um myself and i a friend and one <laughs> it's me myself and i quite literally mm. Um, do, do they have names? Uh, for if we're going down like using disassociative identity disorder terms, Fort is my protector. Mm -hmm. Fort, I think, holds Fort being short for fortress. Fort, I think, Fort, I just realized also in French means strong, which makes more sense as to why I name them that. Mm. Um, Fort, I think, holds most of the memories of what happened to me as a child because I don't remember anything that happened pre six years old, which for some people is normal, but for me is not because I remember a lot of things that had happened six, seven, eight years old, nine years old, despite being mid twenties, early twenties. I only have one memory from that time and it's me, I think, close to three years old, and I'm hiding in between a wall and a washing machine. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I have no other memories outside of that one, though. I think Fort holds all of them, which explains a lot. It's like a, it's like whispering in the back of my head, not quite co louder than a conscious, telling me like straight, telling me things that like I know I should do, like reminders for social communities and things like that. Straighten your back, one foot in front of the other. Remember to look for traffic, things like that. Basically keeping the ball. And on the very rare days where I'm fully able to relax, there is a younger me that comes out. Comes out to play, quote unquote. And it's more, the more childish aspect of myself. Is this They're not fully set. Um, T, I guess we'll use for now. Mm. They have my dead name. Um, as kind of a separation between how I used to be and how I am now. 
And T has a lot of the... T has a lot of things that... Th when they don't know how to deal with things, they just retreat inside kind of thing. It's the part of me that was never able to fully move on from what happened. Whereas Ford and I were able more to come to terms with what happened and... I make sure that I, I'm still in control. Ca Castle is still f fully in control, but occasionally like a minor action here, like a holding of the railing there, those are fort actions of keeping the body safe, keeping us safe. And then playing games like Monopoly, Dutch Blitz. Um, solitaire even. Those were all, like, solitaire in particular, spider solitaire. Oh my lord, spider solitaire and minesweeper are two things that bring out, um, tea specifically. It's the childish, extremely competitive aspect of myself that never got over the fact that my trauma happened, and I never came to terms with it, and I never got closure, so tea is that aspect of that where I am deliberately ignoring it. That, that aspect of me deliberately ignores the trauma and ignores that it happened and pre it pretends everything is sunshine and roses. Uh, rose-tinted glasses is the term. T has rose-tinted glasses on. I've got the sunglasses and the fort has regular, like, regular librarian spectacles. <laughs> I think that's the easiest way to put it in terms of perception. Mm -hmm. Ford and I have come to terms with things and we just, we coexist more on the day to day. Whereas T really only comes out to play on specific events. If I'm playing games like on my computer like Civilization 6 or Stellaris or a few other um, a few other certain games. It's very common that T will actually come out and I tend to smile more and giggle more. A lot of the things that I do as an autistic person don't present themselves when T is out playing. And I've never I've never really been willing to explore why because that would require a lot of extra thing that a lot of extra steps that are just too difficult for all of us to deal with right now. And I believe there is one other, but I have not interacted with them, and they just don't come out, at least if I'm awake. I don't even know if they properly exist, I've just never... I've never dealt with the situation where they've needed to come out. Even then, like... It's common for people with dis with DID in particular to not have full contact with their alters. I don't consider mine on alters, though I consider them different pieces of myself that come out to play. Yeah. They are still me, but they are different pieces of me that I open doors to. I kind of, you know, easily can picture Fortress as your adult self. Uh, and and then T as your your child self it seems to really uh, fit the picture there and because of what happened when you're uh, younger there there seems to you know the hypothesis would be that you know as we use different parts of ourselves to complete the whole puzzle or the whole picture that your puzzle board got you know broken into pieces and you know now it's they're still there but they're not connected. You know, you can access them, but they kind of come out in very peculiar ways. And then, and then, as you mentioned, that you you feel as though that there's another piece, probably off the like if your puzzle is on a table, like that piece is on the floor, and it it's gonna take a lot of effort to get up, you know, reach down, pick that piece up, put it back on the table, look at it, figure out where it goes, and then integrate it with the rest. And I could sort of equate that to processing 
uh, different things that happened in your life, whether traumatic or not. There's a lot of processing that I have yet to do, and I moved over here in the first place to give myself space because I didn't feel like I could do any process back home. Right. There was a couple of things that happened, like my stepdad saying, okay, you or your brother, one of you has to move out, I don't care who, one of you has to go, you're constantly at each other's throats and it's driving us nuts. I was like, well, if I'm going to move out, I'm going to go 8,500 kilometers away from home. <laughs> yeah, only 8,500. <laughs> only 8,500, not the, what is it, like, uh, 11. 11,000 it is, like, halfway across the world or something like that. A we could probably stuff. expand just a little bit more on, like, how each of them comes into play within, like, my social interactions, because I think Fort joins me a little bit on the autism thing, but T definitely doesn't. Huh. Or at the very least, T is more free about the autistic piece than myself or Fort are. And that's a, it's a very interesting thing to think about, because I can even give, like, visualizations as to, um, what sections of me, like, what they're even dressed as and stuff. I've got, like, minor visualizations of what they look like. What does Fortress look um, like? Um, Fort's blonde. Fort has my natural hair color, which is, um, uh, spun, like, like, sun-bleached gold. And you, you've seen me with red hair, which is how I exist now. Um, so that's Castle. But yeah, for, for, yeah, Cass has... Cass has dyed red hair. Fort's hair is... Sun bleach blonde. With, I'd say, like, ashy roots. Because that's how I am. Naturally. And then what does T um, look like? He's wearing the blue dress that I had at um, 10 years old. Hmm. It's a very specific dress um, because it's got... I don't remember the exact print that the skirt had, but the top, it was light blue. I'd have to go back through my grandparents' album and find a picture of it. I've got one or two pictures of me wearing it way back when. It was when I first got my uh, puppy at the time. We had just gotten the puppy. Yeah, if you have any pictures that you would like to include in the video, like please send it 100%. Because we like to use a lot of visualizations that overlay what we're talking about. Um, but next thing I would just ask about is like, you know, would it be too lengthy of a topic to talk about like, you know, I mean, so so how how each of these things affects socialization, but like more so like your friends and family and any difficulties that cause, you know, that, that creates for you being on the spectrum. The biggest difficulty is switching from having T around to having Ford around because they cannot exist in the same space. Mm. Or at the very least, it makes things more difficult when they exist in the same space because they each play a different role in how I interact with people. Right. T comes more out to play when I'm hanging out with my cousins and things like that with younger children because T is a younger mindset. Um, whereas Fortress is more like the business professional side of myself, gets things done, is a go-getter, extremely organized, T scatterbrained as heck. Um, generally, if I'm out socializing with family specifically if it's family it's usually t because t is the aspect of myself that they expect to see and my family never truly let me grow up and did not recognize me as an adult until i moved halfway across the world mm. i was i've been con continually treated as a child up until that point so t is the aspect of what they see Whereas when, when I'm with friends, I present more as myself. And that aspect of me being hyper fixated on random things like food, birds, plants, tattoo art, 
Um, I've got a lot of different random interests. And then, Bort's just kind of there to make sure we don't end up accidentally uh, doing something we're not supposed to. <laughs> um, falling into things. Bort's part of the reason why I'm... I actually Safe. took time to heal a little bit because I fell off a ladder. Yeah. <laughs> I fell, I fell off a ladder, Fort's the reason why I actually went to hold a manager instead of just hiding it from them. Because normally, I, normally myself, I would not report something like that to management as like, oh, I did this. No, Fort's like, no, you need to go, like, you need to go tell, tell a manager. So I went and told my manager, I fell off the ladder, I'm feeling okay, I will let you know if it, I start to feel worse. I'm like, okay, any pain? I'm like, yeah, probably like fifth rib. And they're like, okay. And I continued on with my shift as per normal. That We had it documented, though, just in case. Okay. Um, but there are things that would be like normal social expectation that I need to be reminded of. Or it kind of takes on that, like, push in the direction that I need to go kind of thing. If I need five minutes to take to myself for it's like okay for it's the alarm bell that says now you take it now and for it is my fluency i guess especially when talking to management or talking to superiors i just let for it do most of the talking because for it has better fluency than i do is it flu or so it makes it easier to explain things? So you're you're more articulate when you let Fort take the the steering wheel. So take that particular aspect of the steering wheel, yes. Mm -hmm. I I'm still in control, and I end up staring. In, in an effort to try and make eye contact, I end up staring at people's noses. Not like the tip of their nose either. I stare at the weird little awkward like bridge space between the eyes. Okay. Because it's close enough and people usually can't tell the difference. Or I yeah. stare at the space between their eyebrows or if they have a unibrow there, like the back of my head grip thing that is Oh, unibrow. <laughs> <laughs> so you you'll you'll notice the unibrow before anything else about them. Yes. That's just a me thing, though. That is, I, that is not... Disclaimer, that is not an autistic person thing. We don't just randomly see unibrows. <laughs> my parents are divorced. I'm formally adopted by my grandparents. My mom regained custody of me at 13 years old. And I have not seen much of my biological father died since I was eight. I haven't seen him since I was 13. It's just been me, my mom, my stepdad, and my brother. And I personally don't mind that. You mentioned earlier that you're at your brother's throat. Like, what's the relationship with the rest of your family? Um, with my cousins, it's a bit more relaxed because I'm the eldest and they all look up to me. It gives me a sense, though, of I need to be better than what I am. At the same time, my cousins are incredibly forgiving of my mistakes. And if anything, the protectiveness I have over them is endearing to them a little bit. The girls, honestly, I, I blame one of them in particular for the reason why I can't bake. Um, we tried baking a cake and then her and I, she was quite young at the time, I think she was maybe three or four. Uh, we left out half the ingredients and that is the reason why the cake exploded. <laughs> <laughs> we were baking on our own. It didn't go well. Autistic teenager and a four-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> it does not make it, it doesn't make a great pair. Um, and then last year, um, 
the twins. The twins took me out shopping for um, clothes. They were insistent on me getting a swimsuit because apparently I didn't have one. I, they were like, okay, you need a swimsuit. You live in an ocean town. You need swimsuit. <laughs> I was like, okay, we're going to get a swimsuit. They, they shoved like 20 or so bikini tops in my change room for me to try on before we finally settled on one. It was like the fourth or fifth one that I tried on that I'm like, okay, we're going to get this one. They're like, no, try on these ones too. <laughs> it was very, very, very entertaining for them at least trying to watch me fit into these things. And I'm like, I don't like this. <laughs> well, I mean, as and then we went that... got ice caps and we went to the beach after. <laughs> It sounded, well, so, it's, you know, that's a different kind of, I don't like this. It's like, yeah, this is news, it's kind of uncomfortable, but at the same time, you're enjoying your company with them and kind of trying something new, and then, you know, it sounds like it was uh, enjoyable. It was something where I enjoyed the limited time I had with, with them because um, they live in a different city. Hmm. They were around for the hol for a holiday, and yeah, we went and got um we got frozen coffees afterwards, frozen coffee slushies afterwards, and went to the beach. I think we had to talk about internet safety at the beach. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think we had to talk about internet safety at the beach, and it was. It was a much needed bonding time because I don't get to spend much time with them. My aunts and uncles don't really like me. Mm. I mean, one of my aunts does, but she also married into the family and she has deliberately gone low contact with everybody else except for me. It's not terrible. And I don't mind being mildly disliked by my aunt and uncle because the kids know that they can always come to me for problems and things like that. I'm the dependable cousin. Hmm. And what about your mom and dad? Mm, like I said, I still haven't heard from my birth father since I was a middle schooler. Mm -hmm. Um, Mom and I are doing okay. I think me moving all the way over here has terrified her because I did not believe she viewed me as an adult through most of my early years being back with her as a teenager. Like 13, 14, I didn't think she saw me as a 13, 14 year old, I thought she saw me as a 7 year old mm. because she missed out on most of my childhood. And then at 19 I flew myself out to, I flew myself out to Japan, <laughs> she was like, oh. Bye. <laughs> kind of saw me then as like, okay, my kid's kind of grown up and is doing her own thing. And we've had a pretty good relationship since that. It's been slowly improving and there's been a lot of ups and downs. When you say that, do you mean 19 going to Japan or? I was 19 years old and I flew myself out to Japan on my own dime. And the relationship was good after that point, meaning what happened before then? Oh, um... It was difficult because I felt like I had to constantly prove that I was capable to her. Hmm. I think me being autistic and having the autism diagnosis scared her a little bit because she didn't know how to deal with it. And to be fair, autism is not an easy diagnosis to receive when your, when you just get your child back out of a custody thing. Like, she got, she just got me back, and then within six months she finds out I'm autistic, and we have to go get me an IEP, we have to go get all the therapy set up, and there's all these struggles that she never saw me anticipating, because at that point we just had the PTSD diagnosis. She thought, oh, PTSD, we just put my kid in therapy, um, put in a little bit of work in management, and there we go, problem solved easy, like, the kid will be fine. And then we receive the autism diagnosis, and everything is, like, back to square one, and it's, like, 
As a parent, I can understand her being absolutely terrified for me. Um, I went to France in 2016, and specifically, timeline reference for anybody listening, uh, when Belgium was, uh, when Belgium experienced those terrorist attacks. Um, I was in France at the time, and they, our tour company wanted to send us home, and myself and most of the group were like, nah, we're over here, let's stay. That trip was a little bit scary for her because I wandered off four or five times during that trip, and I came back with all these chaotic stories, and she's like, why is my child doing this? I'm going to get a heart attack. It was like she, moments she cared so, a lot. She cares so much to the point where it's painful for us to be around each other constantly. Mm. And I felt like she was leaving me behind when she and my stepdad got together. I this was before she got me back. They got married before she got me back. But I felt like she was leaving me behind, and then my youngest brother was born when I was 15. And I'm like, oh, she doesn't- I felt like she didn't want me anymore. Because she had this new life that she was starting. With a new husband and new son. And... A lot of the time she didn't have time for me to help me with a lot of my autistic- With my autistic things. I felt like I lost a parent, and it's taken me- basically moving away to realize that I didn't lose her, but she has new priorities and there are times where I am not going to be one of them. Mm. That's a very uh, mature understanding of the, the situation. How old were you when you came to that conclusion? Um, I came to that conclusion back when I was nine. But it didn't I came up with that conclusion back when I was 9, but it didn't truly kick in until I turned 17. Okay. Like, we never say things like, I love you, I don't, don't really hear praise from her. I've never heard her say, I'm proud of you. Hmm. Those exact words, I've never heard her say those. And it makes things difficult because I want the verbal praise from her. And I want to know that I'm doing well in her eyes, that I'm living up to her expectation. But at the same time, I know that I never truly will. It's not going to be a thing. Right. Because that's just how she is. It ended up with me pulling some very terrible things as a teenager, a lot of attention behavior that wasn't good for me, wasn't good for the people around me. And then a death in the family happened and I cleaned up my act a little bit. Kind of kickstarted me into being not that death in the family kickstarted me into not only being better, but also being more authentic to myself, allowing more parts of myself to come out, and then I think it was second year university was the first time that I actually asked for help on anything. I don't ask for help, I don't ask for assistance or things like that, because it's not something that I have witnessed, and I was made to feel ashamed of asking for help as a child. I don't have to worry about that anymore and it's going to be a lot of healing over here for me to learn to not only ask for help but to be comfortable asking for help i i, I cried uh yesterday on shift because my manager was like why do you have your phone on you and it was like I haven't been without a cell phone or a way of calling emergency personnel, like police and things like that. I have not been without a cell phone since I was eight or nine years old. And that was due to circumstance that happened within my family household back then. And I just, I've always had one since then. And I had a panic attack in my staff room, and I made the decision to go two hours without it, and then I kept it in my pocket for the rest of my shift. 
Um, management has said that um, they're willing to work with me to help kind of wean me off of having it on shift. But I do have permission to have my cell phone, despite it being against uh, company policy. I have permission so long as I'm not like texting or anything on that. I'm like, no, it's quite literally just sitting in my pocket. Like, check the cameras all you want. You could have someone stare at me for like three hours and check in the like, am I actively doing thing on my phone? No, it's just sitting in my pocket on do not disturb. It's the having it there is the physical reassurance that I can call the police as needed. Okay. Straight up, I'm sorry, I don't trust the store phone. The store phone is glitchy as heck and you constantly sound like static coming through it. Let's look at, for each of these issues, so, you know, with the anxiety and depression episodes and the quirks of being on the spectrum and family life, what has helped you get through these things? A lot of it has been... Therapy has helped a little bit. Therapy can give you, like, the tips and tricks and things that you need in order to try and cope. A lot of your coping skills, though, are going to come from experience and knowing what works best for you. For me personally, on not so much a bad anxiety day, but a bad depressive day where I don't want to leave my bed, I don't want to do anything like that. Having things like cereal bar, I've got, I found Nature Valley, uh, Nature Valley uh, granola bars over here, and I got so excited because I'm like, Nature Valley! <laughs> um, I don't know why, okay, man? I don't know why. Um, well, I mean, what is it? They taste good? You like the, the, the crunchiness? I, like... I love them so much. Mm. They're something, they're a nostalgic taste, I guess. Like, yeah. my grandma, occasionally when we would go on hikes, or um, when I would go on hikes with my stepdad. Or actually, no. Who was it that gave me a peanut butter bar for the first time? I think it was my grandpa, actually. Somebody gave me a peanut butter Nature Valley granola bar for the first time, and I remember liking it so much, and I would nonstop eat them for like a week until I made myself sick. <laughs> it oh, was... <laughs> they, they're good, Nature okay? Nature Valley um, Halloween. Their Nature Valley, the oats and honey ones specifically, are easy to digest. They're generally gluten free as well as general allergen free so they're good for really anybody it's one of those things where it's like you need a little bit of something in your stomach um have pre-cooked meat don't be ashamed of using pre-cooked meals or things like that or if you have a good day do all of your cooking on that day and then freeze it that way on your bad day you can go and make sure that you've got a meal to throw in the microwave it's finding things that work for you in order for you to cope. And okay. those, be accepting of those terrible days because they're going to come. The terrible days are going to come. It's how you get through them to the next 24 hours that make the difference. Take things 24 hours at a time. Like, honestly, most of the time, I only plan like a week in, a, a week in advance at most for getting things done. I can't, I don't have the energy to do anything more than that. If I need to do long-term appointments, I have a paper calendar that I use. I'll write down appointments on that, or I'll leave my phone as a brain, as a memory, essentially, for dates and things. It works. And don't be afraid to experiment with what you are able to cope with. Okay. Finding out what the things that make your... The, finding the things that trigger your disabilities are going to be a key step in finding things to help you cope. It I didn't figure out what exactly was making me disassociate in class until I realized it was the fact that I could hear most of the classroom and fully comprehend what the classroom was doing. If we were doing group projects, I could hear every single table fully catch on to what they're doing, but I could barely pay attention to my own group because I was so busy listening to theirs and trying mm -hmm. to actively block it out. It wasn't working. 
think I tried doing like a weird Coney or thing for a while <laughs> as an experiment to see like it was like if you cup your ears you can catch um, directional hearing. All right, I got it. So all you had to do is move into another group that you were absolutely doing zero work with to go back and hear your, your the group that you are working with. Huh? Huh? Almost, or the group that I was working with, I would go and cut my ears. I would cut my ear, cup, oh God. like put my Miss hands Van behind Go. them. Yeah. Mm. Well, I'd do that because it was the only way to hear what the heck my other group mates were saying. Jeez. It was annoying. Okay, so. But I finally yeah. figured out I've got um I've got special A and C um headphones now that work on um filtering so they filter out most of the high pitch sound now and i love it yeah a um active noise cancellation a and b active noise cancellation headphone but they're specifically for higher pitch sound like um chihuahua barking anything above pitch wise that and what happens when you hear these high pitches there's a few things that happen a lot of it is like hair raising on the back of the neck kind of feeling, and then the more they hear it, the more it gets worse, and then it starts to turn to a, like tar and molasses over my lungs. That sounds like you. Like you, you have ta an anxiety tar, like up? tar molasses. It's like an it's an anxiety buildup, yeah. It's like a tar molasses feeling making my lungs stick to my ribs. Mm. It's not a nice feeling. What, what have you done that's help these situations so like not like what helps generally but like what goals have you set for yourself that you've achieved to work with these issues the biggest one for me was actively trying like people say get more exercise and things like that i did actually try and get more exercise um as well as the drinking water thing i found the drinking water and staying hydrated helped more um, as well as regulating my caffeine intake, I have now a max, I now have a maximum of, um, 500 milliliters of coffee a day. That's still like, that's two cups, but cutting it back from like five cups to two cups helped and then keeping it at two cups, two cups every day or once every two days just to it's a maintenance caffeine, essentially. It's maintenance caffeine. Okay. Doing things like that helped in helped me. Um, it helped me digest things, and eating well helps. Um, staying away, like <laughs> you have no idea how much staying away from foods like McDonald's, staying away from heavily processed stuff. I understand it's not actively available for everybody. But make the, if you can, because not, I understand not everybody can, but if you can, make the change from white bread to whole grain or multigrain or something like that. Um, don't use like craft cheese slice or things like that. Go and actually get like a block of cheese, one of the big like Costco blocks of cheese. Get one of those. Doing things like, even on your bad days, have like grapes or an apple or something like that simple piece of fruit yes it's high fructose but it's better than nothing and having those foods readily available in the fridge helps um if you're gonna eat things like chips like doritos and stuff like that do it like at most once a month treats are okay as a once in a while thing save them for special occasions but don't have them every day because of that constant like, constant sugar increase will make it everything worse. Especially with kids with autism, ADHD, or, like, intellectual disabilities, it will make us worse. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> aim for at least, like, a liter of water, minimum. A liter and a half of water. So, so this is all the I've... stuff that you've successfully been able to do. Yeah. Um, this is all the stuff like I have a blue thermos, the blue thermos that I mentioned that was the size of my arm. Yeah, no, I'm successfully having at least one of those a day. 
what goals would you say you still need to go after or what's something that you're still struggling with i know when we had last talked or especially during the vrc groups the biggest thing for you was kind of getting out of that toxic environment so that you would have some extra space to process and, and work through some of the uh, childhood trauma and things of that nature. I'm getting there slowly. The first step was leaving my phone in the break room because I've been attached to it for so long. Um, or I've been practicing like leaving it in different parts of the house. Um, I'll have the sound turned up, of course, if I get a phone call, but, um, if I'm going for, if I need to sleep, for example, for my shifts and everything, I will go and leave it in the utility room at the, on the other side of my house. It's things like that where learning, learning to not use my phone as a crutch mm. and only having it out as did. I've so been that... relying on it for so many things for so long that I need to uh, I need to learn to cope without it. Mm. It hurts and it's difficult. Like I said, I cried the first time I left it in the staff room and that was for two hours. Mm. Which is still a big step. But thinking like, okay, well, until I get used to not having it on me for two hours then I'm going to have to up it to three or three or two and a half at the very minimum. And it's baby steps. This is the first part. And then from there, I'm thinking the next goal after what, like being able to be without my phone for four hours is the current goal. And then the next goal after that separate from the phone is, um, and this is after I've got like work work properly established and everything. Um, seeking out a mental health professional to actively work on things with me over here. Because I'm in a completely separate environment. To the point where I don't have to see con- I don't even have to see reminders of my trauma anymore over here. Mm. Whereas back home I had constant visual reminders. I have no reminders of that over here, so it should be a little bit easier to process, in theory. So... Heck, so, I'd even be open to try some EMDR hypnotism. <laughs> Let's give it a shot. Yeah, EMDR would be a really uh, streamlined and, and, and fast way of, of taking it on. And then I know the UK also, I believe, I don't know if it's been approved yet, but there's something called the rewind technique. It's like double triple dis disassociation it's like a mental exercise and basically you just uh god damn it <laughs> you you go through uh the the experience repeatedly not in detail not in visualization but like you you set your mind up to watch yourself watching the memory happen and you eventually it, it gets um processed but EMDR, EMDR is like a, a different way of, of processing it that, that can be a little bit more invasive, but also still uh, resolve the issue fairly quickly so long as you can tolerate it. So if you have a high tolerance... And that's the thing is... Oh, good. I am not easily susceptible to it. Mm. I have a lot of resistance to it, and it was almost impossible mm. back home. So that's where I'd be willing to even try giving it a shot because, like, the atmosphere is so different here. The smells are different here. I think it could work, but it would take a lot of effort and I would need, like, I'd need to book around a week and a half off work in order for me to process stuff like that. Hmm. So I need to be prepared. Yeah, so look into the rewind technique first because that one is not painful. EMDR for many is painful it's just i don't know if if the the rewind technique is clinically approved or not but if you you know if you find someone who can do it you know give it a try because i've heard a lot of positive things about it um so what i'm kind of hearing from this altogether is you know 
you just casually move like you know over over nine thousand kilometers away from home and you're like eh. uh but like when it comes to leaving your phone in the break room you're like holy shit, oh my god i can't do this and you're setting you know a goal to be away from it you know one hour two hours three hours just small steps at a time until eventually you'll be able to leave it in there for the whole shift and once you're over that yeah. then starting to process some things that have kind of uh, bothered you for a while and at which point you know you'll feel a lot lighter you'll have more space and be able to have less anxious and depressive episodes so i mean you you kind of gave a statement before but like if you were to give like the almighty all-encompassing statement of whether advice or guidance or you know something that you would like to say to everybody you know what would you tell them don't be ashamed of your stems because your stems are your way of um, communicating with the outside world. Um, and figure out what your needs are for day-to-day -day life. I apologize for the crackling in the background. I the hunger. And also porridge. I, I need a microwave for porridge. I don't have one. Um, Don't be afraid of your stims because those are a natural part of you coping with your disability. If anything, embrace them because they are going to be with you for the rest of your life. Um, also, don't be ashamed of your hyperfixations because those are your quirks that make you interesting to others. Hmm. I've recently finally figured out what my plant quirk is. I've always loved plants, but I didn't figure out what the quirk about them was. I finally figured it out. It's house plants specifically, like indoor house plants. I've got no thumb for outdoor gardening, but I love indoor house plants. Hmm. So it's finding, find your niche, and specifically keep it as a hobby. Do not make it a career. Your niche should not be your career because you will grow tired of it, and it will cause you stress, and then you'll lose interest in it, and it will hurt and suck. Keep it as a hobby because you love it. Also, minimal drinking. I do not endorse binge drinking. I'm looking at the wine bottle that I have in my flat. I do not endorse binge drinking. Limit one glass a week, maximum. Yes. <laughs> okay. We didn't start the fire. It was always burning to the <laughs> 